Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? And welcome to another session where we're talking now about the shubuhat. In the previous session, we spoke about uh, jihad, uh, which of course is one of the classic uh, shubuhat that anyone has to cover if they are going through um, dawah courses or anything like that, or even attempting to do dawah to a mainstream audience. This one is about the age of Aisha and obviously her union with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we have covered this in the past before. There's lots of materials, lots of discussions, lots of debates that we've done about this. But this will be more of a systematic kind of uh, approach where we go through some of the verses, some of the contentions, some of the histories. Uh, because it's because of the nature of the shubha and because of the fact that it's constantly recycled, regurgitated, reiterated, it requires a little bit of effort from our side uh, so that we can uh, you know, convey... Uh, uh, an answer to this question in, in, in the best possible way. So what we're going to be covering today is the following. We're going to be talking about some of the claims that are being made. okay? And then we're going to be talking about the um, meaning and definition of, let's say, what it means to be an adult, what it means to be a child, all these kinds of things. To what extent are these things social constructs or, or not? And then we'll look at some verses of the Qur'an uh, which are oft repeated in these discussions, namely we're going to be looking at chapter 65, verse 4, a very kind of oft-repeated verse in Surah Al-Talaq on this matter. And then we're going to kind of uh, relay this all back to the re relevance uh, of the discourse. Now, before we start, I think we need to kind of think about what I, ref what I can refer to here are the meta-ethical considerations. Uh, first question, which is very important before talking about anything which is moral, is where do you get your morality from? I mean, this is a very simple question. Because in the da'wah, when people ask us questions and people kind of um, interrogate us or cross-examine us or at least think that they can, there is already an assumption that's being made. And the assumption is that there is a truth, a moral truth that should be taken for granted that we both know about. But in this case, actually, there isn't because we both have different starting points depending on who we're speaking to and that needs to be fleshed out another meta-ethical consideration is we've got to think about who's asking the question so if the person is a Christian, if the person is a Jew, if the person is an atheist because depending on what the, who the person is I think that the response should be tailored to whatever that, that person is and we're going to be looking at uh, something which is, especially if the person's a Christian or a Jew, I think very important and I think one of the strongest arguments which can be used, which is a verse of the Bible, chapter 31, verse 18 of the book of Numbers. And we're going to be looking at some of the scholastic resources relating to that, some hermeneutical resources and, and so on. And then we're going to be looking at Hinduism as well. And now we're adding new information which maybe we haven't spoken about before because now obviously there's discussions between us and Hindus and Hindus, some Hindus, not all Hindus, will bring this up, or can bring this up, or would bring this up in discussions as well. How do we respond to Hindus? And of course, with atheism, I've kind of alluded to this already, but with atheists or agnostics or whoever they may be, if they come forward with this kind of thing, the meta-ethical questions will have to start to be put into play, uh, questions relating to morality and so on. And we also need to look at two fallacies in particular, which are one of them is a fallacy of presentism, where you think that today what we're going through, what we've decided, our cultural apparatus, our cultural machinery of today, 21st century, or even to be quite honest in the Western world, who's, which is dominating the world, the morality that we have decided is the morality, which should be the bar barometer for everything else. And so, obviously, this brings us to another thing, which is called anachronism. And anachronism is where you take today's standards and you put it backwards on different civilizations and cultures. And we also, because we have to look at the fact that with this whole situation, we don't find at the time of the Prophet, not a single narration of someone at the time who was the detractor of the Prophet using this issue as a means to try and attack the Prophet's credibility. So uh, let's get someone re reading. Um, who wants to read uh, the, um, some of the translations? Tell us what translations they are. 
of Numbers 31, 18. Because we want to start with the Christian and Jewish discourse. Obviously, Numbers is a book of the Bible, the Old Testament. It's actually one of the books of the Torah uh, as well, according to the Hebrew, uh, sorry, according to the Jewish tradition. So, uh, Mahdi, have you got it in front of you? Okay. Who's got it in front of them? Can someone read the... It's on the third page of the of the slides. Shakar, have you got it in front of you? Okay. So, uh, if you could read it for us and then uh, and tell us what translations there are and stuff like that. <coughs> uh, this is the King's, the King James version. Yeah. It says that, um, but all the women, children, uh, but all the women, children that have not known a man by sleeping with him, keep alive for yourselves. Okay. Give us another translation. Um, this is the New International Version. One second. The New International Version says that, but save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Uh, we can use as well the. There's a lot of additions have to be understanding, but uh, the, Engl the English Standard Version. But all the young girls who have not known man by lying with him keep alive for yourselves. The uh, New King James Version, but keep alive for yourselves all the young girls who have not known a man intimately. And it's the same thing over and over. Okay. Now, um, in looking at the other slides, what scholarly resources uh, are there which you could use? Say, for example, if you're speaking to a Jew, what would you, what would you, what would you use? Talmud. All right. Excellent. What, first of all, tell me why the Talmud. What? How do Jews conceive of the Talmud? As I understand it, it's an authoritative, um, uh, exegetical source for, like. Uh, explanations of the Old Testament. Be aware of the the word exegetical because that's more with what is referred to as the Midrashim. So yeah, the, the I would say it's more jurisprudential in that sense because it, um, the Midrashim, which is the plural for the word Midrash, is the exegesis of, uh, for example, uh, the Old Testament. And so they, there's two d streams of authoritative text uh, that the Jews have. There's the exegetical works, which are referred to as Midrashim or Midrash. Uh, like, for example, Genesis Rabbah. Genesis Rabbah. And this, by the way, according to some sources, has been written maybe about 300 years after Christ, not after Moses. So the Midrashim was only codified like 300 years after Christ. At the same kind of time that Origin of Alexandria was writing or something like that. So and then you have the Talmudic texts and they themselves are divided into different subgroups. So the Talmud is divided into like, for example, you have the Palestinian Talmud, you have the Babylonian Talmud and so on. And so if we're talking about Ahkam or if you like jurisprudence stuff, then the Talmudic texts are more uh, obviously relevant here. And if we're talking about exegetical stuff in the Midrashim is more relevant. All of this can really be accessed in a, I think there's a, there's an online database now called safaria.com. Safaria.com and it's been trans, a lot of it has been translated. So if somebody wanted to, to access Jewish works, you can actually use keywords by using safaria dot com I think it's Safaria is it Safaria dot com uh, with an S Safaria dot com and you can write down and you'll see the different things which by, by the way this website includes both exegetical works and jurisprudential works so it includes the Talmud and it includes the Midrashim as well you know so bear that bear that all in mind so when we're talking about uh, rulings obviously the Talmudic texts would be way more authoritative than the mid Midrashim uh, in that regard. Okay, so what does, tell us something about what it says there with the Talmud uh, that you've seen. Look at uh, anyone, uh, look at uh, the fourth slide and look at all the different things. There is a, uh, 
there is a bullet point that speaks about a particular type of Talmud. Babylonian Talmud. Is it that one? Okay. No, actually, this is the Palestinian Talmud that I'm looking at here. Unless you're looking at something different. Look at the fourth uh, bullet point. Sorry, the fifth bullet point. The requirement of age. The one, yeah. The Talmud of the land of Israel, known as the Palestinian Talmud. Can anyone see that? Yeah. All right, can you read that? Mentions how the, how the earliest uh, of scholars interpreted numbers. Yep. Kept as slips, kept as slip girls. Okay, so uh, where does now this is w now the next extract, next bullet point, is what the ba is what the Palestinian Talmud says. So, um, do you want to read that? So, Sam Simon says the requirement is that her age of virginity, that is three years, uh, occurred within the sanctity of Israel. Yep. Uh, it was so to along the along the same lines in the name of uh, uh, R. Simeon, mm. a girl who converted at the age of less than three years and one day is buried for her marriage into the priesthood. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the scriptural, scriptural basis of this view? Um, but all the young girls who have not known man by lying with him uh, kept alive for yourself. Mm -hmm. There's numbers 39, So the way that the Talmud usually works is that they cite a name of an authority. Okay, so they're like Arsimian, whoever it may be, yeah? And then they'll say something like, this person states X, Y, Z, and then this is the evidence that they're using. So the Talmudic text is stronger than a person's opinion. It's, it's closer to the authority of, let's say, Lijma. It's closer to that. So here, is, our Simeon is saying that the requirement is that um, her age of virginity, that is three years, occurs in the sanctity of Israel. And then you have Phineas, a priest, was with them. And he also said, how do rab he, he, he was asked the question, how do rabbis interpret, keep her life for yourself? To them, it says that they should keep them alive for themselves as slave boys and slave girls. And then, uh, as you can see here, it's uh, the the reference is mentioned. Maybe we can put the reference somewhere, but uh, the reference is mentioned. Now, someone will say, "Well, okay, this may be valid to some Jews, but it's not valid to the average evangelical Christian, or it's not something. In, it's not. They are not uh, obligated to believe in, in this." Why is this still relevant to us? How is this Numbers 3118 important now, even if you're speaking to Christians? Yeah. It indicates that uh, a couple of things. Number one, it was at least understood by some heavy authorities at a particular time in this particular way. And uh, particularly as it relates to Christians, this was something that was sanctioned by God. And so the Old Testament, New Testament distinction doesn't really work or as a defense in this regard because uh, Jesus is also the God of the Old Testament. Who Beautiful. I, this is what I wanted to get because uh, Christians would, would, would say that the Godhead, which includes Father, Son and Holy Spirit, authored the Old Testament. So Jesus authored the, New Te the Old Testament is a true statement. Now, according to them, if Jesus authored the, New Te uh, the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is telling us you can take slave girls for yourself that are prepubescent, therefore, Jesus sanctioned this thing at least at one time. Now, there's only one thing you can say to this, which is that you can say, well, that was, you can take a poor line uh, approach to it and say, well, because Jesus died for our sins, we're no longer obliged to look at the laws of the Old Testament. And if we do take that, what would be the problem with that, Mahdi, if we take this kind of approach, this poor line approach? What would be a response to that? So, say, for instance, if someone said to you, 
you said to them, well, you, you've got this verse in the Old Testament, which is Numbers 31.18, which says that you can take the young girls, the taf, this is the Hebrew word that's being used, you can take the young girls for yourself. It's being interpreted and translated as young girls. It was interpreted by the, the old uh, Jewish rabbis in the Talmudic texts as being young girls. It means slavery, it means them having sex with them. Say, no problem. If they say, fine, even if we admit for the sake of argument, now you're speaking to a Christian, that that's the case, they'll say, uh, then Jesus died for our sins. We no longer need to be uh, compelled to those laws. What would be your response to that response? Would it be, sorry. Would it be that... Uh, I think Jesus said he came to uphold the, the old covenant as well. See, that's one, uh, that is one possible re response, which is to go down the Jamesian, if you like, route and say, well, actually, there's too many verses in the New Testament which would indicate that Jesus didn't come and abolish anything, in fact. He said it himself. But there's something else which goes back to our discussion about different types of morality. I would say... Even if that's true, you still had people practicing, people, heavy people like uh, uh, scholars practicing uh, what they want to call a pedophilia. No? Mm -hmm. So they, they can't really come to us and say, oh, you prophet did this or did that. Yeah, but if you put the articulation in that thing it will be like you know it's a it's too cuckoo fallacy it's like you know you're saying what about you well you're admitting it for yourself but you're nearly there and i think this is where we should take a pause and start exploring this i want you to work in pairs yeah and speak about how you would answer this question because this is the stage two of the argument here i think we've all established stage one stage one is if you're speaking to a christian or a jew let's say a christian because the majority of the people that you may speak to are going to be christians and or a, a large portion of them, then they say, well, now God has uh, come and died for our sins, Jesus has died for our sins, so these laws are no longer applicable to us. Let's, let's have a quick break of two, three minutes. Everyone think about it and work in pairs, and then after that we'll come back and uh, present, inshallah. Okay, so we just had a discussion in the class, and we're going to come um, now and present some of the things. The question, just to remind everyone, is this, is that, say for example, you're having a discussion with a Christian, Yes, and we're at the point where you're having a discussion with a Christian and what you've done is you presented something of the Old Testament in Numbers 13, 18, uh, 31, 18 where it says keep the young girls for yourself, keep the taff for yourself. Okay, everyone knows the verse now and then you've shown them some, um, some evidence, some you know, jurisprudential evidence that this means young girls and the rabbi said it and it's in the Palestinian Talmud and there's much authority on this and linguistically and jurisprudentially and whatever. They say, fine, let's say for the, for the sake of argument, they agree. But they say, now we have uh, Jesus Christ who died for our sins. And so we don't, all these things that happened in the Old Testament, some of the genocides and kill the donkey and do this and all that, all that stuff is irrelevant to us. We even condemn it. It's not something which we would, um, would say. So it's, it's not applicable to us. Whereas what you guys say is that your prophet is a role model for all times and all places. There's a great difference here. So how would you, for example, Ali, how would you respond to this? Okay, so from obviously what I've learned from yourself is um, that we ask the question is that do you believe that it's categorically wrong or consequentially? Okay, wrong? good. So th those are the two questions we ask uh, because if at one moment they accept that in the Old Testament Jesus, their God, uh, stipulated this, so then th they can't say it's categorically wrong. Beautiful. Okay, uh, this is good. I think if we start with an atheist or a Christian with this one question, I guarantee you always logically win this argument. So let me give you the question. Okay, the question is, do you believe having intercourse with somebody at the age of nine? Because let's just be clear about what this situation is. Having intercourse with a female at the age of nine is categorically wrong or consequentially wrong. So you're giving them two options. They have two options. Categorically wrong means it's wrong in all times and all places. Consequentially wrong means it's wrong because of a consequence. So they have two options. Let's say they say, the Christian says, for example, it's categorically wrong. It's always wrong for someone to have sex with someone at the age of nine in any time, in any place. It's categorically wrong. 
going back to Kantian ethics that we've spoken about before, yeah? If they say that, then say, fine, okay, then what are you going to say? Actually, let me ask you, what would you say? Well, what, to the Christian? Yeah, if they say it's well, categorically wrong well, here. Well, we're saying you're basically saying that your God did something wrong. Beautiful. Or stipulated Could something wrong. Your, your God stipulated something which was wrong. Morally wrong. Morally wrong. Because if you're saying it's categorically wrong, all times and all places, your Jesus, who you're saying is the Old Testament God and the author of the Old Testament, told us to do something which was wrong, which is worse than doing it itself because you're now legalizing it for everyone to do it. It's not just one person. It's now all of the people that you've allowed it. But what if they say it's consequentially wrong? Um, then obviously it depends on time and like... It depends on the situation because okay. it's now based on the harm principle. Beautiful. So yeah. you ask them what consequence are you talking about? Yes. This goes back to our London Air thing, if you guys remember. This was the, there's a line in London Air that spoke about this. It's, this is it. This is the master key to this particular thing. You ask them, is it categorically wrong? If they say yes, they lose. Definitely they lose. Yeah. You can understand why they lose, yeah? Everyone understands why. If they say it's consequentially wrong, we ask them, what was the, what's the consequence that you're saying that if it's there, then it becomes morally, morally wrong? What, what, what's the one that you just mentioned? Um, like, uh, I said uh, harm factor. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. They're almost definitely going to mention harm. Yeah. Because if they don't mention harm, then you go back to categorical. Because what are you going to mention? Oh, it's just wrong. Oh, it's just wrong. That's now you're going into categorical. It's just wrong, it's just wrong. It's, you don't need to mention any consequences. So let's just say they mentioned harm. What's the argument we're going to put forward? Or what, what's the question that we're going to put forward? We're going to say the burden of proof is upon the one who's making the claim. As the Prophet ﷺ told us, and it's a logical principle, in the, that certainly the burden of proof is upon the one that's making the claim. So now you have to show us how this caused Aisha harm. You have a plethora of historical information. Everything, there's a hadith of the Prophet, he said that, record everything that comes out of my two lips. And then the Sahabi said, even the anger stuff that you say, he said, yeah, even if, if I'm speaking of anger, we record it. So we have even things which would seem to embarrass the Prophet Muhammad in the Quran and in the Sunnah. We have all these things, all of his marriages recorded, everything. Just give us one piece of evidence that this actually harmed Aisha radiallahu anha. This would be the, the line of reasoning. But going back, if they say it's categorically wrong, then they're in trouble. If they say it's consequentially wrong, then they don't have a case. What about, what about if he's an atheist? If you say he can say it's categorically Same. wrong. If uh, the atheist uh, says it's categorically wrong. Yeah, because he doesn't have a scripture to... Yeah, no. If the atheist says categorically wrong, now he has to prove why. Because on what basis is then, can an atheist have any kind of morality? Because... Think about it. When we, when we, were, fa when we were doing uh, Kantian ethics, and this goes back to that, if someone says it's categorically wrong, does anyone remember how Kant proved that things were categorically wrong? Is it the, um, if everyone done in society, society wouldn't function. Yes. What's he, it called? Cate categorical he called it the imperative? categorical imperative. Yeah. But there's no way of proving the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative is at best a thought exercise, a thought experiment. It's at best a thought experiment. It's not hard science, it's not mathematics. So there's no way of proving as an eight, the best, I would say, the best attempt that has probably been made in the history of ethics has been by Immanuel Kant. That's why he's so prominent. Because the whole point of him is he's trying to show that ethics, you can, you can derive ethics without religion. That was what he was trying to achieve. So he, he showed us a different way, however, even that way is not solid. So if an atheist says it's categorically wrong, he still needs to go to the harm factor. No. No, he, he has to. Because if he says it's categorically wrong, and we say to him, why is it categorically wrong? He's going to say because it harms the... No, no, no. If he says it's categorically wrong, he'll yeah. s he'll s he, he can use a Kant's categorical imperative. Which, yeah, is, which is still a harm factor. It's if not a harm factor. But if everybody lied, it will cause harm to the society. It's not harm, it's impossibility. They'll say it's the, imp the, the society will not function. Which is a harm. It's not about harm here. But not functioning, is it not some sort of an... It's not a consequence. It's not about consequence. So, okay. Because remember, deontological ethics yeah. or Kantian ethics is in many ways opposed or is opposite to consequentialism. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's... 
it's really interesting because there's a book I, I recommend for everyone actually if you want to like the beginnings of ethics and stuff it's a book by Jay Mackey I think I've mentioned it to you guys before this is like the staple book for ethics that I think everyone should have it's called ethics <coughs> it's by Jay Mackey and he's an atheist and in the he's a very famous atheist uh, he mentions at the, in the end of his book, and I'll never forget this, he mentions at the end of his book is that the only way you would know an objective reality, and I'm just paraphrasing here, but is if they were in a list from God, yeah, and he quote-unquote list from God, like you would not know what the objective moralities are unless they were from a list from God or something like that. The point is, is that with categorical things or objective moralities, there's no actual way of deriving that, inf extrapolating that information. So just remember, what you're going to come in with is, you're going to come in, is it categorically wrong or is it consequentially wrong? The third type of morality is virtue ethics, yeah? Virtue ethics, uh, you know, Nicomachean ethics of uh, Aristotle and these guys. But that, that doesn't have a mechanism. That's why no one ma uses it in law. But really, this is where it is. It's either consequentially wrong or categorically wrong. Once you've identified where the others are trapped everywhere, you always will win here. You will always win here. If, you, if, they go categorical, if they go categorically wrong, it's all if statements. If they choose categorically wrong, yes, they have to either prove it if they're an atheist, which they won't be able to. The burden of proof relies on that. If they're a Christian, they lose because it's in the Old Testament. So going back to if it's consequentially wrong, they have to prove it again. The burden of proof because they're making the claim. They have to prove that it caused harm to Aisha radiallahu anha. You see? So then you're throwing the burden of proof all the way on, back on them. They have to justify. They have to justify. Because they want us on the back foot. But if you, if you organize it in a nice way, then they're on the back foot. And that has a psychological impact, especially if you're speaking in front of people. So you justify to me. But you justify to me. But you're making the claim. That has, that's very powerful. You're pushing them onto the ropes. You're starting to hit them on the body now. They're the ones that need to throw back. They're in trouble. And that's what we want. Now, let's go to the next bit of this. <coughs> so the hadith itself, if we look at the hadith, it states that it's narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, he, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu married me when I was six years old and consummated the marriage when I was nine. Then I remained with him for nine years, i.e. until his death. And she also narrated, she goes, I had seen my parents following Islam since I attained the age of puberty. So she admits that she had attained the age of puberty. Not a day passed by, but the Prophet visited us both in the mornings and evenings. My father, Abu Bakr, thought of a building, oh, sorry, thought of building a mosque in the courtyard of his house, and he did so. He used to pray and recite the Quran in it. The pagan women and their children used to stand uh, by him and look at him with surprise. Abu Bakr was a soft-hearted person and could not help weeping while reciting the Quran. The chiefs of Quraysh uh, pagans became afraid of that. Now, this is clear because it's saying that she, she is claiming herself that she had attained the age of puberty, which is very important. And there are two issues here which we have to kind of extract. There's a difference between a nikah contract, okay, and the consummation of the marriage. A nikah contract is, I mean, Ibn Qudama mentions in his Mughni, for example, he mentions that the contract is, it's like a business deal of some sorts. It doesn't necessarily mean that there has to be sexual interaction. Because when you use the word marriage in, in the English, it indicates that, oh, when he married her at the age of six, he didn't marry her in all that it means to marry someone, in the modern age. It just means that there was a contract. There was an agreement in place. <laughs> and number two is uh, intercourse. And what I want to submit to you guys after having read some of the fiqhi tracts and, you know, jurisprudential texts and stuff, is that the opinion of what the jurists really is that the person must be capable. Qudra. Or istata'a that the woman must be capable of it. And I mentioned this, I mentioned very uh, you know, sticky examples maybe we should say, 
of it. And, and this is not necessarily with someone of a younger age. It could be someone with an older age. You know, if someone here <laughs> marries a hundred-year-old woman, this could be haram, what you do to her. Or she's breaking your body and this and that. Bec or if, let's say she's, you're marrying somebody who's got um, a disease of some sort. She's malnourished. She's, you know, and you want to perform the sexual rites with her. You go to a certain village or a certain place in a malnourished place, an impoverished place, a different disenfranchised person. She hasn't got the ability. So the, the Dabit or the, the Islamic position on this is simply if the person is capable of doing it. Now the question obviously is, who defines capability? And the, Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلِ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of specialism if you don't know. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَنْ تَطَبَّبَ وَلَمْ يَكُمْ بِالطِّبِ مَعْرُوفًا فَأَصَابَ النَّفْسًا فَهُوَ ضَامِنْ Whoever tries to be a doctor and he's not with the, being a doctor or practitioner of a medicine acquainted and he harms a, a person, then that person is responsible. So in other words, doctors or medical professionals have a place in Islam by the nas of the hadith. And Qadi Ayad here, as you, as you can see, I've, I've sent uh, you guys it. So where, where he says, uh, you know, إِنَّمَا يَتَمَكَّنُوا أَمِنَ الْإِسْتِمْتَعْ بِهَا So, you know, when she's uh, before that, فَمَتَى كَانَتْ تَصْلُحُ الْوَطْرَ You know, when she was able to have intercourse. That's why the three years, as you mentioned. Because al Qadi Ayad here is not, he's writing, I don't know, 600, 700 years ago. He's, whenever he wrote, I don't know when he died, by the way. When did he die? I don't know. Maybe more than that, actually. But he was, uh, he's mentioning, clearly, that she has to be capable of it. You know? Now, someone will reply and say, well, hold on. Uh, but if she was meant to be an adult, why is there this hadith of her playing with dolls? Playing with dolls. That, you know, that she was playing with dolls and this and that. It's narrated. Uh, and Ibn Hajar even says, it has some a kalam on this, which I've put in there for you guys. So you can read it. So I want you guys to work as pairs again and think about this for five minutes. Say, well, and you hear this, you hear this interrogation. Do you want to say something? Do you want to read the hadith? Should we read the hadith? Narrated to Aisha, I used to play with dolls in the presence of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's apostle used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves, but the Prophet ﷺ would call them join, uh, to join and play with me. Uh, the playing with dolls and similar images is forbidden, but this is not part of the hadith. That's, that's commentary. Yeah, commentary, yeah. So now, what do you call it? Uh, think about how you would respond to that. So I'm going to give you guys five minutes, seven minutes, yeah, and then we'll come back and present. Yeah. So the question now is, why is she playing with dolls if she was meant to be so mature? Alright, so um, how would you respond to this doll's inquiry? Ali Dawa. Uh, personally, I'll say there's an assumption that, firstly, that she was um, a child. Uh, because the, the assumption is that just because a person plays with a doll, it automatically means that they are prepubescent. Then that means there's a lot of people that play with PlayStation or toys or dolls. Do we, just, do we make a conclusion that this person is, you know, what, a specific age? That's that's number one. I would say personally, a, a person playing with dolls doesn't, it doesn't, it's, it, it's, it, doesn't it doesn't mean it's, that. It's simple, but it's true. It's you know? true, and also yeah. the thing is, um, from what I remember, is that in Fatul Bari, uh, Ibn Hajar Asqalani, he actually said that he quoted this hadith, and he said um, this was at the time of Battle of Khaybar or the Battle of Tabuk, and this was way before, way after when they got married. So she was around fourteen or fifteen years old. So again, the assumption is they are, they, are, they are thinking that she was a specific age, but uh, she was around 14, 15. Well, I like that piece of information. So, so two, yeah, the, two angles. Number one, um, just because somebody, an individual plays with dolls, doesn't mean that they are a specific age. 
because even at today's time we have that. And secondly, I think we have evidence. I think times you've, you've dealt with this uh, show behind. Now yeah, you're yeah, becoming yeah, somewhat yeah. of an expert in the matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you yeah. want, I can teach you. <laughs> 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 well, that's, yeah. what, that's what you're doing right now. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, the, the, some credit Sheikh Ujayri actually is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, all credit. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well done. That's uh, so. The age is is very important. Uh, what else would you uh, guys mention? Sixteen years, actually. Because well, uh, okay. uh, she was nine at two, uh, the second year of Hijra, and Tabuk was in the ninth. So we have nine at to it. Let's say seven years. Oh, she's sixteen. Yeah. So sixteen, about oh, sixteen. Wow. Between wow. fifteen and sixteen. What about Tabuk? Because it says Tabuk or Khaybar. What was the? Yeah, it's mentioned Tabuk or Khaybar. Is Tabuk in, older in than Khaybar? The hadith. The, the, I'm not really sure. Because then it makes her older. No, Tabuk's the last one. Then it makes her older. If we go with Tabuk, but let's go with Khaybar. She's uh, seven, sixteen. Wow. I mean, sixteen, fifteen, yeah. yeah. Well, there you have it. So she's got she's past the age of consent, according to <laughs> now. Now, now the enemy doesn't have much uh, am, ammo at all. But let's just l- emphasize the issue that yeah. there's no contradiction between playing and being an adult. Absolutely, it's possible. Yeah. Actually, Absolutely. Actually, you know what's very interesting? Because um, when I was there, there was two people that were bringing this uh, shubahat. There was one Murtad girl, Murtada, and uh, it was David Wood. And David Wood, when he was talking about this, behind him he had a little doll. I don't know if you guys saw it, yeah? He, he actually owns one. So we actually pointed out and he's like, look, you're a grown man. And right behind you when he's doing the video, there's like a little, you know, like a character. Yeah, you know, these, yeah, oh Allah was laughing my head off. Like how Allah humiliated him. But yeah, it was <laughs> interesting. 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 The fact that she was playing with uh, other girls and stuff like that, what relevance is that? I mean, why is that important? I guess it's maybe the fallacy of presentism that... When we think about kids playing together, you know, we just have this imagination of young little girls who are just playing with their dolls and running around mm-hmm. and playing hide and seek. So because we have that in our minds, we are ascribing it to uh, back then, I would say personally. No, uh, could it not also be speculated? I mean, one could say, like, for example, you've got children, I've got children. You not play with them sometimes, right? So can one speculate that, well, she was doing that because she was trying to entertain the, the, the other girls that were younger than her? Do you see the point? Like you know, she because why is it that she's doing it? Why isn't she playing alone, Yanni? Oh, okay. She's playing in the presence of other girls. Like for example, if I played with my kids the other day, played to- toys. I brought the you know the Buzz Light ears and this kind of things <laughs> and uh, to infinity and beyond and this and that and play this and and then I, I told my son you know there's no such thing as infinity and beyond because of what we went through today with the Ghazali. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> and then he didn't understand that what I was talking about. But the, the point is is. Yeah, that's that is especially considering the other points that you just made. Very well, obviously, with with the great help, well, you know. Stop carrying praising me, please. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. you see, this doesn't prove anything. Uh, what I mean today, nowadays, we have Halloween. Yeah. Almost everyone's playing with toys now. There's um, like almost, as a, you know, this makeup and these things. Everyone's a character, and Elon Musk is coming out with I don't know what he's dressed up as. This is playing with toys in my eyes, you know. Yeah. He's playing with toys and he comes out and this and that. And pe- people like to... I mean, nowadays we have anime. You know there's animes and stuff like that. And they've even got a sexual version anime. of it. Anime. 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 I don't know. Yeah. Even, there's, even there's pornographic versions of it now. Yeah. No, honestly. I mean, the people are around watching cartoons, yeah. uh, you know, for these things. But these are grown people that are watching anime. One Punch Man and all these things. And I don't know. I've never seen... Uh, I thought I was the One Punch Man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Huge industry yeah. for mm. games for adults yeah. on PlayStation. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's like the most unremarkable thing in uh, any nowadays. Uh, people are playing Minecraft, Roblox. Yeah. My children are playing Roblox. Yeah. Yeah. My, my How old is he? He's in his thirties, forties. No, but I mean, the, the, the kids are now sharing spaces with adults. I mean, it's quite dangerous, actually, when you think about it. But I mean, uh, k- kids are playing Roblox, yeah. Minecraft. You know Minecraft. It's it's a ridiculous game. It's like Legos moving about and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I've gone back in time, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm watching my kids like they were so shocked. They're like, yeah, let me let me show you Minecraft. I was like, let me come and see this Minecraft. I thought it was going to be amazing graphics. Yeah, yeah, now yeah, yeah, my yeah. time, you know, we had PlayStation Two, <coughs> a PS One and PS Two. I thought now PlayStation Five, this the graphics are going to be out of this world. I saw some bl- uh, blocks and it got back to the SNES times, Super Super Nintendos and Nintendo sixty four. <laughs> And the kids are really, they love it and stuff. And, and then adults play it. And then some adult came to my house and he was playing it and he was really into it. And I was thinking, what is this thing? 
<laughs> but playing games is something which, you know, it unites. By the way, this unites the ch children with the adults. It's the best language to unite. Some of the best bonding experience I've had with my children has been with the medium of playing games. I asked my children recently, actually, I said, well, what do you like about what I do with you? He, they said, the number one of the things that they said is playing games, you know, like, you know, rough and tumble play, you know, pretending to hit them and, you know, obviously, you know, just the pretending. <laughs> and, you know, this is rough and tumble and this and that and play, choke slams and F5 and all this kind of thing. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, but, you know, that that is... Uh, I think we've answered it quite well, but if there's anything else that uh, someone wants to continue, I'll tell you something that Laurie, Laurie Wilkie says. She is an individual, I think she's a psychologist, she says the following. She says, Highly valued toys and childhood objects can be curated well into adulthood and passed on to subsequent generations of children. Therefore, artifacts found in the archaeological record may not adequately reflect the full range of material culture used and cherished by the users. What do you think this means, uh, Mahdi? Oh, bro, I wasn't even listening. Oh, well, this is the problem. <laughs> let, me, let me read it one more time, yeah? Highly valued toys and childhood objects can be curated well into adulthood and passed on to subsequent generations of children. Therefore, artifacts found in the archaeological record may not adequately reflect the full range of material culture, material culture used and cherished by the users. Toys, yeah, uh, yes, yes, it can be. And therefore, it shouldn't be used as proof to say that someone was a child. No? Good. Yes. Okay, now I've got a secondary objection. This is objection one. I'm going to make it harder for everyone now. Uh, you know, today we're making it harder. Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani was a Shafi, okay, as you guys know, and he wrote Fatah al-Bari and so on. And the Shafi's allow, as, as do many of the madahib, they allow uh, the playing with toys for children. Have you noticed this? Have you come across this fatwa before? I think, I think that's, the, um, that's the reason the hadith you read in the commentary actually, the, the, they explain, they say this was allowed for Aisha because she was a child. Um, yeah, I, so I get it, but yeah. now the question is, if it's allowed, because now the argument comes forward, Say, look, your scholars say, not just in the Shafi Ahmed, but in other Madahib, your scholars say that uh, if you're a child, you're allowed to play with toys with faces on them. But here you have clearly Aisha playing with the toys with the faces on them. Therefore, she's a child, according to your own well, that's what, that's <laughs> speculation. Now, okay, before we, before we answer this, because now I'm going to stage two interrogation, speak to the person next to you for the next three to five minutes, and then we'll come back and answer this. All right, so uh, on that, um, Ali, can you summarize for us uh, how would you respond to this dull uh, question? Okay, so um, after discussing with Sheikh Ujairi, um, we came to a few conclusions that, um, so obviously we have another hadith of the Prophet that um, he prohibited uh, his wife Aisha uh, of having specific, maybe some kind of pillow or with facial features. So we have that. Um, so it shows that it was prohibited uh, to his wife. Um, but then we have another hadith which we, we're discussing now is about when he came in and he said um, like what are these and his wife uh, said that these are my daughters um, but um, the, the Prophet ﷺ obviously asked him specifically about a specific doe um, if we want to call it that which had wings um, so she gave a description about it uh, so obviously from here that um, yes there's the opinion of the Shafi is that um, this could mean that she was a child but we can say that the, uh, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ in the other hadith with the pillows mentioned that the, the pillows had uh, facial features which shows that that was not permissible but with these dolls that she had uh, we can assume that the fact that the Prophet ﷺ didn't mention facial features that it was those for, the, for an adult to play with without the facial features Yeah, just like so this for example Yeah, just, yeah. just like the one you have there yeah, <laughs> like What do you want to call it? Let's call it Bobby Bobby <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to break and inshallah next week we're going to go for part two of this session. Obviously because of its uh, relevance to the discourse, we're going to do a two-part series with this or two-part session with this. 
And with that, I conclude. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.